Our first speaker this afternoon is Sean Tonner, uh, and she has her master's in library science from McGill University and a master of science in instructional systems and design from Florida State University. She's currently director of library services at North Georgia College and State University in Dahlonega. Yes? Dahlonega? Dahlonega. Dahlonega, Georgia. And serves as, uh, I was thinking Talladega, you know, no. <laughs> serves as a library faculty liaison to nursing and physical therapy. Professional interests include the design of academic library facilities to support and extend learning, as well as the design, delivery, and assessment of library instruction and information literacy. Thank you very much. Uh, how's this for sound? Can you hear me? Oh, very good. Yeah, Talladega is an entirely different <laughs> culture. I knew this librarian 30 years ago, worked in a large complex ARL library. And back then, that instruction consisted of taking a tour of the library, where the librarian very helpfully pointed out all the key services. The librarian would meet these 30, 40 students in the lobby, take them on a 50-minute tour through the facility, ending up on the third floor near the grand staircase. The librarian would have covered everything, everything they needed to know about the library, because that was library instruction. The librarian would thank the students for their attendance and their attention and dismiss them, and almost inevitably, they wouldn't go away. Some student would get up the nerve to say, excuse me, can you tell me how to get out of this building? They're on a third floor. And that leads me to my topic today. That is the best example of authentic assessment that I could bring you. True, authentic assessment. It took, and if you haven't figured it out, the librarian was me, <laughs> and about another half a dozen. It took a while before we recognized that assessment and modified what we were doing. So today, I am still working on authentic assessment, and I still often look at the face of that student. I'm going to talk about authentic assessment in perhaps the most challenging learning environment for me, which is the 50-minute one-shot. Okay. All you have to do is hammer it out of the park, right? It's the 50-minute one-shot. They come in, you fill them up, they go away. Before I get too far along here, let me give you a little quick environmental scan. North Georgia College is about 5,500 students, small school. About four years ago, five years ago, we taught very little. We reached a tiny fraction, maybe no more than about 10 or 15 classes a year. This program has grown today to reaching 48% of the student body in a typical academic year. There are a couple of really good reasons for this. One, we have a hot new facility. Librarian became central in the minds on campus. It became a building of importance. We have very good, and I won't use the term hot, but we have very good librarians as well. And then the third and the real most important reason is information literacy was adopted as our quality enhancement plan as parts of our, a part of our SACS reaffirmation, our accreditation. Information literacy is across the curriculum and also evaluated in co-curricula. This ought to mean we are teaching better. We're getting to teach more. I'm not sure we're teaching better. Also, as part of this backdrop with authentic assessment, the university uses both sales, 100% in the 1,000 level student group, and at the 3,000 level, we used to use iSkills, but we had to move away from the ECT pro uh, product because of uh, some issues, and we moved to, at evaluating the 3,000, 4,000 level, uh, the James Madison information literacy. 
test. Both of those are standardized multiple choice tests. So we have a catbird seat, I guess you could say. So my plan here is to uh, work with a, a definition of authentic assessment. What is it? We'll touch a little bit on how to use it, and I hope encourage you to use it, and touch on why we use it. Authentic assessment, that bicycle that, that we heard earlier, that's authentic assessment. For me, my theme here that I'm using is just, it's the driver's test, get behind the wheel. Um, and it's performance-centered evaluation. It's also known as uh, performance assessment or authentic education. In this, you ask students to demonstrate <laughs> newly acquired knowledge and apply it to problems, real world problems. Get the book. I'm not going to spend my time describing the intricacies of the Library of Congress classification system. Go get the book. Perform. To quote Grant Higgins, who is a leading proponent of authentic ed education, what we're trying to do is engage students in worthy problems or questions of importance. These things matter to them. And this performance has to be compared to a standard for that performance. The student's performance is judged against something, but it's got to be a clear standard with expectations that ideally these expectations have been distributed by your faculty member colleague prior to the student entering the classroom. So the student has an idea of what the expectations is. The reason we push hard to get the rubric or whatever standard in advance is because it will give that student just a little bit more time to reflect and to self-evaluate. And of course, it's not just the student who's reflecting or self-evaluating. It's the instructor. That's our opportunity as well. So just as a, a quick summary of what authentic assess, uh, evaluation is or assessment is, is it's performance-based assessment where students engage in worthy problems and the performance is compared to a known standard. So how do you cram this into a 50-minute one-shot? where your biggest challenge is time. We've heard a little bit about this today. It's backwards planning. And again, Grant Wiggins uh, and, uh, and the Understanding by Design is one of the critical books that I find most useful. It starts with answering the question, what are the essential skills that we want our students to be able to perform at the end of this instruction and practice period. It starts with almost an emerging of the assessment and the outcome. Being realistic about what can be accomplished in 50 minutes is the biggest challenge. Of course, after you have this clear idea of what they are going to do, and your, your time is being spent prior to stepping in foot in that classroom. It's developing whatever assessment method you're going to use, whether it's a rubric or journaling or a pretest post test, even if you wanted. Uh, what, those are all available to you. And then, of course, developing your curriculum and, and the tools that you'll use to enable this learning. Negotiation. You're asking a bunch of students to take a risk in a classroom where they're probably hoping they can sit back and check their email or whatever the heck they check these days. <laughs> Negotiating those outcomes and the performance starts, and this is extremely time consuming and preparing, it starts working with that faculty member. You know, first of all, what are the outcomes? What is it that you really want to get out of this? 
coming up with an agreed set of outcomes or outcome in many cases uh, and limiting that to one, maybe two, um, without a partner who's willing to negotiate, we won't touch authentic assessment in that particular class. If that faculty member is uh, my, not my partner, then we'll go for a more traditional method in a 50-minute one-shot. It's the person who's willing to take a risk and have their students take a risk in the classroom. We have a very useful uh, instructional menu that was developed by my colleague, Betsy Whitley. And it is a really good starting point for negotiating. And it's, it's kind of a, here's the menu for today. We could do some of this, and we could do some of that. And she estimated, what does, how much time does it take to deliver the critical information and give students time to practice? At that point, they're probably going to be ready for performance. So having just a, a device like this already prepared and in the can really makes for a much richer conversation with that faculty member, or your partner in this endeavor. Once you've got agreed upon outcomes, you also slash, you have your assessment ready to roll. Then you're going to spend more time developing whatever tools going to work for assessment, uh, whether it's a rubric or some other means of assessment. I know have, uh, we've heard a lot about rubrics, and I have a colleague speaking this afternoon on rubrics, so I won't spend too much time. But analyzing, this is just kind of a generic uh, rubric that I came across uh, in uh, uh, journal not too long ago. Very, very basic uh, explanation of tools you could use. You could uh, evaluate the student groups or the individual student's technique when they're demonstrating the uh, results, the quality of the results. You could analyze uh, how much time it took. The time is a factor that might be a, a worthy uh, means of assessment. How independent they're able to work. That's, that's useful. And it's just getting the broad range. So what does a beginner look like? What does an intermediate performer look like? And what does a, oh, I lost that my, my battery, your battery is probably run out too. Um, and what does mastery look like? Thank you. Getting that rubric, and I'll just kind of emphasize this, students really care about how they, prepare, uh, how they compare to a rubric. And I work primarily with nurses and uh, physical therapy students. They really care. Those are all very A-type behavior, uh, behavior students. And they really want to know. They're very comfortable working with rubrics. They really want to know where they fall in this thing. And I have a handout. I'm just going to pass this out. That m thank you. That might give you uh, an idea of uh, this planning tool, the planning approach that we use. And uh, there's a sample rubric on that as well. This planning tool is thanks to Deb Gilchrist. We are all at my library, graduates of ACRL information immersion, a couple levels. And we have uh, some going up for the third level uh, assessment. Should send them first to assessment, I think. So that that planning tool is uh, straight from uh, uh, Deb's uh, school and then adapted uh, by our university uh, for our purposes. It's also a great negotiation tool with your faculty member. You know, okay, well, you know, just let me get through this. What is it we want to do, and how will we know if we did it? That's a, that's a stops the show right there. Um, often, and I'm sure you experience this, you have the faculty member who asks you to do the library. Is that a dance? <laughs> do the library. Well, this tool is something they understand. They have a syllabus for their class as well. So it helps you work that through. So you're all ready. You've got your outcomes. You've got your assessment. 
You've got a rubric, you've got your uh, curriculum, and your pedagogy, underlying. You're ready to go. So it's on to the class, right? Now the clock is ticking. I routinely, when I'm working in authentic assessment, from, from the get-go, the students are broken up into small groups. Three people is, is an ideal working group. It takes a class of 30 and means you're dealing with a group of tens. Everybody gets to perform. I teach briefly. I'm not allowed to talk for more than 10 minutes. Right. That's a demonstration. Here's how I do it with emphasis on I. You can do it differently. Here's how I get this done. The time's got to be given to the student. It's relinquishing the lectern. You're relinquishing control. Teach briefly, 10 minutes. Give 10 to 20 minutes to the students to practice and intervene as necessary. I bring my posse. I have lots of uh, staff members who are uh, part-time library school students. They are welcome into all of our classrooms. We actually want them in our classrooms. That gives some assistance. We don't force the, we try not to interrupt the student when they're practiced, practicing. We will um, answer questions. We will intervene when invited. So we have now consumed 25 minutes of a 50-minute one-shot. They finished their practice. And it's showtime. OK, so you've got 10 groups. They don't know you from Adam. They've got their instructor in the classroom because that's part of that negotiation. Well, if we're going to do authentic assessment, we really need you in the classroom with us. It helps set the atmosphere. And uh, what I have found is that the first hand up is not the first group up. Okay? When I ask for someone to come up and demonstrate what they've discovered, the first hand up is the master. And they'll intimidate the heck out of the rest of the group. So find another way. Do the envelope of opportunity. You know, have an envelope, pull, pull, hey, Team A, who's Team A? Come on up. It's your, it's your show. What we basically do is turn the lectern over. You've got somebody handling the computer. They're not speaking because I don't know about you, but when I teach, I don't handle a computer particularly well either. So we've got two speakers who are doing the teaching part. We've got a rubric and Part of my job as the instructor in that classroom, it's the old Toastmasters rule, to create a comfortable learning environment where you are allowed to succeed and you're also allowed to fail. That the feedback that's given by the other teams of, oh, no, no, poke, poke down further, that kind of feedback is welcome and encouraged. I work through as many teams as there is time in 25 minutes. Come show us how you broke down that citation and figured out you had to go to interlibrary loan, that the library didn't own it. Show us how you took that abbreviation and untangled it using Google. Uh, th in this kind of example, actually in that example that we passed out, we all of us apparently are struggling with citations, breaking citations down. My job at this point is to be away in the corner and to let the, to encourage and facilitate the process. So just to summarize, okay, that's the how. Plan backwards, right? What are they going to be able to do? That's your assessment. How are you going to figure out they can do that? And how are you going to figure out how well they can do that? Build your curriculum, curriculum and, uh, and uh, pedagogy, what are the activities that you're going to have them do to practice, to master this? Stand and briefly deliver. When I teach and have others uh, on staff observing me, 
I often ask them to pay attention to one or two things in my teaching style. Can you help me make sure I speak less? Oh, be quiet. Can you help me make sure that I don't intervene too often? So, so my staff who are observing me or other uh, faculty colleagues who are coming in and observing me, we've got a plan. They, they're evaluating my performance as well in writing, which is kind of hard because I'm their boss. You know, I'm the director of the library too, but they don't have any trouble telling me what I'm doing wrong. So I'm very, apparently they, we have a, a very comfortable working environment. That's all there is to it. Just do it, repeat it, get better at it. Um, traditional and authentic uh, assessment is just a quick table that gives you an idea of uh, how to compare, how they compare. Um, I can tell you that you need both. I can tell you that people laugh more in the classroom with authentic assessment. There's some dynamic in that classroom where uh, that's different than my pre-test, post-test classroom. That authentic assessment classroom, for some reason, I get more conversations after the class in the hallway and follow-up phone calls, hey, can I sit down with you and have you look at my clinical research statement, see what I'm, how it looks. So I'm, I'm interested that, in that. I guess perhaps the reason is, it truly is student focused. I'll give you a second to have a look at this. <laughs> so there's lots of times authentic assessment is not a good tool to use. <laughs> and I'm ready for questions. When you have the students working on their hands-on activities, are they all working on the same problem so that when they come up, they're all reporting on the same thing, or do they work on different problems so that different topics are yeah, they're all working on different problems. I'll take a textbook that has, in this example, uh, bibliographies at the end of, or work cited at the end of a chapter. I'll photocopy those. Team A gets one copy of the list of references and uh, three people working on that same thing. And in that group of three, they begin to discover who's got more skills than the other. It's a good question. So it's it's uh, they're all working on different topics, and uh, each topic peels off another layer of that onion. If, for example, you're working on citation, breaking a citation down, and actually getting something into your hand. Yes. Maybe you said this, but when um, you are filling out your sort of grading rubric, yes. Um, how much of that is shared with the student. How much is um, uh, how much of the conversation when they're presenting their work? Um, do you give them feedback on um, that? Sorry, because you know it's one thing for students to think that oh they handled it really well, but then the learning comes in from the librarian. I suppose when you can um, guide them for the more right answer. Yeah, I, I'd say that the the guidance really seems to come from the more expert students in the class. That yes, they get feedback from me and it tends to be the old Toastmasters, tell them a good thing they did, tell them a thing they need to work on, and tell them a good thing they did. It's the standard kind of Toastmasters thing. I keep that date, uh, I keep the rubric myself and that uh, helps me understand just from a numerical point of view what's this class scoring like on this particular learning outcome is there something else that I need to be doing maybe that ten, is there something I need to be doing that in my 10 minutes that will make them move uh, to a higher level
Um, I, that's my 10 minutes. That's my presentation. So I have a very clear plan of what I'm going to cover. I am, there are many roads to getting that performance into the adequate and mastery level. Um, I have to tell you that I've learned more from the students on tech, things I didn't know I could do. Uh, so I found in, uh, some, in some of the demonstrations, students are approaching the information in a totally refreshing and interesting way. Now, it's a very clear outcome. You know, we are going to request something through interlibrary loan. Uh, and it's step one, step two, step three. But occasionally, they can jump from step one to step five better than I did. And it's just a different way of getting to the end. I guess the end is more important, um, although I will look at time. You know, you struggled. We didn't really need to find the abstract in a database to request that through interlibrary loan. I don't know if that helped. Uh, it's just another tool. <laughs>